Hi, my name is Mike Wildridge. I'd like to introduce you to a series of films I've made about multi-agent systems. These films are designed to accompany my textbook, An Introduction to Multi-Agent Systems, the second edition of which was published in 2009 by John Wiley and Sons. For each chapter in the book, I took what I thought were the key learning concepts and made a short film to explain them. I hope you find these films useful and instructive, although I should of course add that these films are not supposed to replace reading the book itself or of course turning up for lectures. If you have any suggestions or corrections relating to these films, I'd be very grateful to receive them. I want to say a few words about where the multi-agent systems paradigm comes from, that is how we've ended up studying these things that we call multi-agent systems. Now, students often assume, kind of naively, that new scientific developments, things like programming languages and programming paradigms, kind of emerge spontaneously, that somebody wakes up one morning with a good idea and that that's how things happen, but of course that's not how they happen. Uh, they emerge from, typically from, ideas that are prevalent at the time, trends that are prevalent at the time, and multi-agent systems are no exception. So what I'm going to argue is that multi-agent systems arise from five trends that have been ongoing throughout the history of computing to date. And those trends are towards ubiquity, interconnection, intelligence, delegation, and human orientation. So let me say a little bit about each of those trends in turn. So the first one, ubiquity. When something's ubiquitous, it just means it's everywhere. And when we talk about ubiquitous computing, we mean computer processing power everywhere, in every technological artifact that we construct. And this ubiquity uh, that we're seeing, the increasing spread of computer processing power into devices and places that we wouldn't have imagined putting them a few years ago, is happening for a number of reasons, but most importantly, it's happening because of things like Moore's Law. Moore's Law tells us that the cost of computer processing power decreases year on year. Roughly speaking, it says something like the cost of computer processing power decreases by half, every year, year on year, an exponential decrease in the cost. And it also says that uh, the size of computer processors and the amount of power that they require is going down steadily. So as a consequence of that, we're able to embed computer processing capability, information processing capability, into devices and into places that we couldn't have imagined even a few years ago. Okay, so that's ubiquity the spread of computer processing power, embedding information processing capability into every technological artifact that we can imagine. The second trend is towards interconnection. So not just have we got these uh, uh, processes embedded within every device that we can imagine, they're able to communicate with one another. Okay? They're able to send messages, exchange data with one another. And there are similar trends, like Moore's Law, which roughly say that the cost of sending a bit from one place to another uh, will decrease uh, in, in, over any given year period. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper to send data. The pipes down which we transmit data get wider. And that's the trend towards interconnection. It's most obvious at the growth of the internet over the last two decades. But it's also in, uh, evident in things like mobile phones, the fact that we now use mobile phones to transmit and receive data, digital data. The third trend uh, is not so much a technological trend. The first two, ubiquity, uh, interconnection, are very much technology push trends. Uh, intelligence is more of a sort of a, a pull trend. It's what we want computers to do. So here I have to be a little bit cautious about the word intelligence because of course there is a large area called artificial intelligence which is about constructing devices that are capable of human-like intelligence. And here I mean something slightly weaker. What I mean here is just the idea that the complexity of the tasks that we can get computers to perform grows steadily year on year. And unlike Moore's Law, this isn't an exponential growth. Okay, so the complexity of tasks that we are capable of automating and getting computers to solve for us grows steadily year on year. Okay, so that's intelligence. Delegation, this fourth trend, delegation, simply means that we're happy to hand over more and more parts of our lives, every day more and more parts of our lives, to computers and let computers handle those on our behalf. So the most extreme example of this is things like fly-by-wire aircraft. 
So uh, the idea of fly-by-wire aircraft is that you take a human out of the control loop and you put a computer there in place. So it's a computer ultimately controlling or piloting an aircraft. And when this idea of fly-by-wire aircraft became commonplace in the 1980s, it was actually extremely contentious. A lot of people were very uncomfortable with the idea of delegating this authority, this capability of flying a plane to an aircraft. Well, now we take it for granted, it happens all the time and we don't notice it. And I think most people would accept that, in fact, it's led to improvements uh, in air safety. Okay? Where are we going next? Next on the agenda, well, fly-by-wire cars or drive-by-wire cars. Okay? So we can imagine um, automated cruise control systems, automated braking systems in cars, where we begin to hand over more and more control of the car to a computer, until ultimately we'll have computers driving those cars on our behalf. So delegation, the trend towards handing over control, delegating tasks to computers. And then the final trend is towards human orientation. And the idea here is that the way that we interact with computers becomes ever more like the way that we interact with people. So let's see why this is. It's most evident uh, if you look at the progression of developments in things like programming languages. So back in the 1950s, when the first real stored program computers were, uh, uh, were devised, the way that you programmed them was you had a row of switches. And the switch in this direction on, uh, in here meant there's a 1 in this bit of memory. And down here, if the switch was down here, it meant a 0 in this bit of memory. So you programmed the device by filling up memory by flicking switches in that way. Incredibly crude, incredibly primitive, not very productive. And so it didn't take long for people to figure out that there must be better, more efficient ways of people interacting with machines. So they started to develop programming languages that made it easier for people to program machines. So we saw machine code, uh, which then led into the idea of assembly language. The assembly language, one of the key ideas that you didn't know exactly where everything was in memory. You didn't have to know where everything was in memory. Then in the 1950s, the idea of machine-independent programming languages, languages like COBOL, Fortran, Lisp, the early machine-independent programming languages, where you could learn a language on one machine, and then the programs that you wrote would work more or less without change on another machine. The idea of subroutines, labelling a section of code with a meaningful name, and being able to invoke that code by that meaningful name, making it easier for people to structure code which led into the idea of procedures and functions in languages like Algol and Pascal, into abstract data types, into the state-of-the-art objects. So let's pause for a moment and think about where the idea of objects, as in object-oriented programming, came from. Where did it come from? Well, people understood that when we interact with devices in the world around us, devices like this plug, this socket here, okay, we interact with them by doing things to them. So I press this switch this way, tells this device something. I press it the other way, it tells it something else. This is the interface of the de device, and what I can do with it is analogous to invoking a method in the object-oriented sense. And objects were supposed to reflect this idea of um, uh, devices with these well-defined interfaces that we could do things to, interact with in that way. And this was supposed to be a software analogue of these real-world objects. Well, the world certainly is full of objects, but it's also full of agents, people like you and me, things like companies and governments, that are all not just waiting to have things done to them, to have methods invoked on them, but are all busy actively pursuing their own agendas by performing actions on their own behalf. Okay? So if we accept that the world is full of objects and a programming language should represent that, then perhaps also, if we want to reflect the reality of the world we're in, which is full of agents, like you and me and governments and companies, then perhaps we need analogues of agents in software as well. So we've seen these five trends. The trends toward ubiquity, computer processing power everywhere, interconnection, the idea that these processors can communicate with one another. Intelligence, they're capable of solving more and more complex tasks. Delegation, the idea that we hand over control to these things. And finally, human orientation, the way that we interact with them uh, more resembles the way that we interact with people. So that's the future of computing. Okay? I, I, I'm pretty sure that, and I think many other researchers would agree with me, that the future of computing looks like that. Ubiquity, interconnection, intelligence, delegation, human, -oriented, human orientation. So where is that leading us? 
Well, what I'm arguing is that leads us to something like multi-agent systems. So where is this idea leading us then? Well, what I'm arguing is that where it leads us is to the idea of agents. And so let's introduce the first of several definitions of agents that we're going to use in this book and in this series of videos. And this is the simplest definition. So when we think about an agent, we're thinking about a, a computer system which is acting on our behalf. It's acting to carry out some delegated task on our behalf, and it's doing this in some kind of semi-autonomous, semi-intelligent way. And very often, that agent will have to interact with other agents that are acting on behalf of other people. And when you put those agents together, what you get is a multi-agent system. Okay? And when you put those agents together and they're acting on, each, on, on behalf of other individuals, then the issues that you start to have to worry about are not just issues like deadlock and livelock that have been studied in the distributed or network systems community. They're issues like, how are we going to build these agents so that they can cooperate and coordinate with one another? What if, in order to achieve my goal, then my piece of software, my agent, needs to negotiate with your agent, where your agent is trying to achieve your goal? So issues like cooperation, coordination, and negotiation have not been studied until relatively recently in computer science. And this is one of the big contributions, in my view, of the multi-agent systems paradigm. So an agent, our first definition of an agent, is just a semi-autonomous piece of software which acts on behalf of its owner or user, that is figuring out how to satisfy its owner's or its user's goals or desires on their behalf. And a multi-agent system is where such agents are just interacting with one another. And the key issue there is that they require the ability to cooperate, coordinate and negotiate with other agents in order to achieve their delegated goals. Let's see a couple of examples of agents uh, uh, being used in practice. So the first one is admittedly a little bit extreme, but it's nevertheless an important one. And this is to do with... Um, uh, this is to do with space probes. Okay, so when NASA or similar organizations like the European Space Agency, ESA, when they send out space probes to, let's say, the outer planets, the way that things work is these space probes don't do any thinking for themselves. That is, everything they do is planned in meticulous detail by a ground crew, a large ground crew of highly paid engineers, uh, who, who in, in essence produce a program of instructions which is transmitted to the space probe and blindly executed. And these instructions will be along the lines of open this valve for this many seconds, then close it, then open this valve for this many seconds, then see if you can, uh, uh, then see if you can, you can track some particular signal, those sort of things. Very low level, blindly executed list of instructions. Well, for all sorts of reasons, this is not a terribly desirable state of affairs. The most obvious reason is that if things go wrong and your probe is in the outer planets, your ability to handle things going well, going wrong, is extremely limited. Okay? If the probe's not thinking for itself and it encounters a situation that the ground crew didn't anticipate, then uh, game over. Okay, so that's one reason why it's not desirable. Another reason why it's not desirable, frankly, is that this is incredibly labour-intensive. It's extremely expensive to have highly paid NASA engineers or ESA engineers producing these very low-level lists of instructions which are sent up to a space probe and blindly executed. So for these reasons, uh, it seems desirable to give space probes and similar higher degrees of autonomy, that is to offload some of the decision-making to the space probe itself, so that, for example, it can deal with some unforeseen situations. Now, again, we need to, we need to wrap this in some caution marks. We're not thinking about space probes that want to decide to change their mind about where they're going to go. You know, I'm going to go to Uranus instead of Venus. That's not the point. But just to have greater decision-making capability on board these space probes so that when things go wrong, they're better able to handle it. Okay? And the overall system is more robust. Okay, so uh, to test out these ideas, NASA deployed a space probe in, I believe, 1998. The space probe was called DS-1, where they used a software architecture for decision-making, uh, which is very closely related to some of those that we're going to study in these films and in the textbook. Okay, well, most of us 
uh, don't write software for NASA, so that's perhaps a little bit of an extreme example. So let's have a look at a slightly more everyday example. And this is one that got a lot of people excited when the internet emerged in the 1980s. So the idea is having agents that operate for us on the internet. So every day, millions of people use the internet for routine but rather tedious tasks. So for example, I've got to book some uh, business travel, and which involves booking a taxi, well, it involves finding out about appropriate flights first to a particular destination, let's say Frankfurt, then once I've found the different flights, comparing the details of those flights, do they fit with my required timings, are the costs okay, are these airlines happy, the ones that I'm happy to fly with, and so on. Okay, so once I've identified the flight, then I need to start booking things like hotels uh, in Frankfurt. I need to book a taxi or however it is that I'm going to get to the airport and make more detailed arrangements. And all of this is in some sense routine. The information's all there on the internet, but assembling it, putting it together in the right way, given my preferences, it, at the moment requires people to do, to do, to do this. So why not have a computer program that could do this kind of thing for us, that could assemble a package of, let's say, uh, a flight, a hotel and so on, on my behalf, given that it knows about my preferences, about which airlines I like to fly with, which airlines I don't like to fly with, the fact that I don't like flying through Paris Charles de Gaulle Airport because they always lose my luggage, and so on, right? To take all these things into account. Uh, and this is the idea of internet agents. And as I say, it's an idea that a lot of people got excited about in the 1990s and for which significant progress has, uh, has been made. So this example here on the slide just explains the idea of a, an agent which is capable of assembling uh, a, a package uh, of information given some requirements that you have, where you go to a number of different websites in order to get partial solutions to a particular problem and is then capable of assembling those partial solutions to make an overall solution. So that's the idea of internet agents. So, in summary then, an agent is a computer program that's capable of taking some delegated task or goal and working semi-autonomously in order to accomplish that task or achieve that goal. A multi-agent system is where a number of such agents meet and interact, and the key point is that if their goals are different, and they will be if typically if they're acting on behalf of different owners or different users, then they need the ability to cooperate, coordinate, or negotiate with one another in order to operate effectively. We've seen two examples, the NASA space probe example and the slightly more mundane, but nevertheless important, internet agents example to illustrate this idea. So what is this course about? Right? I've painted you a vision of what I think agents are and why I think agents are important. What is this course about? Well, it's about two key problems. These two key problems are, firstly, if we want to build one of these agents, how do we do it? How do we put a single agent together? And the key issue there is the decision making. Going from a delegated goal, a goal or a task which a user or owner gives to a computer program and figuring out for itself how to accomplish that task, deciding what to do. Something that can decide what to do essentially is an agent. And that's the agent design problem. And the society design problem is what happens when you put a bunch of these agents uh, together with one another. How can we design computer programs that can cooperate, coordinate, or negotiate with one another in order to accomplish these goals? And we sometimes talk about these two different perspectives on the multi-agent systems paradigm as being the micro and macro perspectives. The last point that I want to talk about relating to chapter one of the book uh, is some common objections to multi-agent systems. That is uh, some standard questions that you get when presenting these kind of ideas to people either in computer science or from other, uh, other disciplines. Um, so the first question that you get is, um, isn't this thing that you're doing, isn't what you're doing when you talk about multi-agent systems, isn't it just a distributed system? Well, multi-agent systems by their nature are distributed or concurrent systems. You have a bunch of processing nodes and they communicate by exchanging messages over some kind of communication infrastructure or some data network or similar. But viewing a uh, multi-agent system as a distributed system is really missing the point completely for the following reason. Let's take an example. 
We'll take the example of eBay. Now on eBay, uh, which is very like a multi-agent system, except that the, the participants in eBay are people, uh, you've got people buying and selling things. And typically the buyer wants the lowest price possible, and the seller wants the highest price possible. Now you could view eBay as a distributed system. You could start to think about all the classic distributed system questions like does, does my eBay protocol ensure that there is no deadlock and no live lock and all these kinds of things that you want to ensure about distributed systems? But you're really missing the point. The point about eBay is that the seller is trying to get a low price and the buyer is trying to get a high price. So there are strategic considerations there. And if you want to understand why so many of the things happen on eBay that do happen, you have to look at those and understand those strategic considerations. So a classic behaviour on eBay is what's called sniping. So if you've ever done an eBay auction, let's say it's, it's over a week, you're auctioning some item, let's say a second-hand laptop, uh, and you allow a week for the eBay auction, then you see that nothing happens, and nothing happens, and nothing happens, and you think, nobody's going to buy my laptop. And then all of a sudden, at the last minute possible, there's a flurry of activity where people try and submit the last bid possible. And that behaviour is called sniping. A distributed systems analysis of eBay is not going to predict that behaviour. It's not going to tell, it, tell you that it happens. It happens because people are trying to get the best deal possible for themselves and they're acting strategically to get that deal. Okay? So in order to understand systems like eBay and so on, okay, and there are many, many systems in the world like eBay today that have this characteristic of having entities engaged in the system with their own goals, their own agenda, that are trying to achieve the best for themselves and behaving strategically to do that, you need to start thinking about what those goals are and issues like the strategic behaviour of the participants in order to understand it. So in summary, multi-agent systems, yes there are ideas from distributed and concurrent systems there, but what's different is we take into account the fact that these are the participants in the distributed system are self-interest. They're trying to get the best outcome for themselves. Question number two, isn't it all just AI? Isn't this something which AI has been studying for decades? Well, certainly you could take the view that artificial intelligence is all about constructing agents. Okay? You can think of, in the classic Turing test, you could think about the participant, the, the, the entity who's being tested for being a, a person or a computer, you can think about that as being an agent. But really, AI has proceeded to break intelligence down into its components, things like learning and problem solving and perception, breaking AI, the overall AI problem down into these component entities. In multi-agent systems, in autonomous agents and multi-agent systems, we're interested in synthesizing those, those capabilities into building complete agents, complete decision makers that can act on their own. Uh, so, no, it's not quite uh, AI. It's not quite the classic AI project. We're not interested typically in the components of intelligence, but in putting them together into making individual agents. So, isn't it all economics or game theory? So, game theory is the, the mathematical part of economics which studies interactions between self-interested entities. Well, so it certainly sounds like multi-agent systems. They're interested in strategic considerations. They're interested in how self-interested entities interact. But what we bring in multi-agent systems, which is different, is the idea that these entities are uh, information processing, computational entities with finite memory, finite processing capabilities that have to make decisions in finite time. And this brings a whole new slant onto economics or game theory, because many of the solutions that have been developed and proposed within economics and game theory completely ignore computational considerations. So to put it another way, a lot of what's called the solution concepts that are proposed in game theory were developed in complete ignorance of uh, uh, ideas like computational complexity. And it turns out if you try to automate those solutions, if you try to write programs that figure out the solutions that are proposed within economics or game theory, it just doesn't work because they're computationally too hard. So no, it's different to economics and game theory because we bring this idea that the entities are computational entities with limited computational resources. Okay, and that brings a completely different slant onto economics and game theory. Interestingly, 
uh, it's, it's one of the founders of the, the um, computing discipline, was John von Neumann, who also, uh, by historical accident, was also one of the founders of the game theory discipline. So it's interesting to see these two disciplines come back together again after 60 years or so. Okay, then finally, isn't it all just the social sciences? Well, the social sciences try to understand societies of humans, how and why societies of humans behave the way they do. Okay? So they develop all sorts of theories uh, and uh, models which try to predict and understand how human societies work. Well, again, we can take inspiration from those models, uh, but what we're building is something quite different. We don't need to be bound by the models that operate in human societies. We, can, we, can, uh, we have to take cognizance of the fact that the entities that we're building are information processing computational entities. Uh, and that gives a rather different twist to the classic social sciences view, where you're trying to understand a society that's actually out there already. So again, the main difference is what we're talking about are computational entities. Here. We're not talking about human societies, we're talking about computational entities. In this video, I want to address myself to one of the core questions that students ask related to multi-agent systems, that is, what is an agent? Well, in earlier videos, in chapter one of the book, we saw a very first definition of what is an agent. What I want to do now is dig a little bit deeper into this definition and explore some of the properties that we might expect agents to exhibit. So in chapter one, we saw uh, that the main point about agents is that they are autonomous entities. Autonomy, in this sense, simply means having the capability to decide for itself how best to go about achieving its delegated goals. So our very first definition of an agent, an agent is just a computer system that's capable of autonomous action for deciding for itself how to achieve its delegated goals. And we often think of agents as being situated in some environment and engaged in a close coupled loop with that environment, where they continually sense the environment, that is, they look at the environment, they get information about that environment, on the basis of that information, they decide what to do next, what action to perform next in pursuit of their delegated goal, their delegated agenda, and then acting, that is, performing some action in the environment, which typically changes the environment. Uh, on the, uh, once acting, we then think of them sensing the environment again, think of them looking to see what the effect of their actions was, then deciding again, and then acting, and so on. So continually going around this sense, decide, act loop. So sense, decide, act, sense, decide, act, and so on. Okay? So an agent, a situated entity, an entity that's situated in, in an environment that's semi-autonomous, that's capable of deciding for itself how best to achieve its delegated goals. Uh, here's a picture to try to illustrate this. So here on the right hand side we have our agent, here's our environment, it's capable of doing things, performing actions in this environment. We can think of these things as being effectors or actuators. These are just things that do things to the environment. So our agent has a bunch of actions that it can perform in the environment which modify the environment on, in some way. The agent then gets feedback through some sensors, it gets some perceptual information, some sensor data, some perceptual data, which then feeds into the decision-making process in the middle here. So, perceive or sense the environment, decide what to do, and then act. Acting changes the environment, the agent then perceives it again, so continually going around this perceive, decide, act loop. So this is an agent in its environment. Uh, we can pick up another, uh, a number of uh, systems which have these kind of capabilities, but which we don't usually glorify by calling agents. And so here are a few uh, relatively uninteresting agents. So a classic example, this is an example that you come across a lot in the literature, is a thermostat. Okay, so we can think of a thermostat as being a very simple kind of agent. And the delegated goal, the thing that we want it to do, is to maintain the temperature in the room within some certain range. Uh, so it's perceiving the environment, it's making a decision about what to do, and then it has some actions available. And those actions might be to switch the heating on, or to switch some air conditioning on, and so on. And as a consequence of performing those actions, the environment changes, 
if you switch the heating on, the temperature in the environment raises, uh, rises, uh, it perceives its environment again and makes another decision about what to do in that environment. So a thermostat, the delegated goal is just to maintain room temperature. The actions are things like switch the heating on or off. Uh, another example is a, a, a venerable Unix program called BIF. And what Unix did, this Unix BIF program did, is that it would simply monitor your incoming email. And when you had new email that you hadn't read, it would simply raise a flag on your GUI, on your user interface, to let you know that there was some unread email. And as soon as you read it, it would simply hide that flag again. So BIF was sat away in the background, it's what's called a Unix daemon, a process that sits in the background on the Unix operating system, and simply continually performs this look at the environment, look at the incoming email, decide whether you need to raise or lower this flag, and those are the actions that are available to you. So the actions here are unlike these, these actions in the thermostat example, which are actions in the physical world, which affect the physical world, the actions in the Unix BIF program are affecting a virtual world, a software environment. In fact, what they're affecting is a GUI. Well, we don't think of these entities as being uh, agents. Why don't we think of them as being agents? Because the decision making they do is, is too simple. So they satisfy that basic definition we gave, they've got some delegated goal, they decide for themselves how best to achieve this delegated goal, uh, and the thermostat decides whether to switch the heating on or off, but the decision making there is trivial. I mean, in older thermostats, the decision making was so trivial that it used to be encoded in a, a bimetallic strip, a strip of metal that when it heated up would bend this way, opening a circuit, and then when it cooled down again it would bend the other way, closing the circuit, and closing the circuit would switch the heating on or off. So very, very trivial decision making. So because the decision making in these examples is so trivial, that's why we don't usually think of them as being agents. So this begs the question, what kinds of decision-making capability, what attributes of decision-making, what kinds of behaviours would you think an agent would have to exhibit in order to, to be called an agent, in order to, to be worthy of the term an agent? And that's the issue we're going to look at next. The question I want to address in this video is what kinds of behaviours, what kind of attributes would you expect a system to exhibit in order for us to think it worthy of calling it an agent? That is, what kinds of attributes are we going to be talking about building uh, into the systems that we call agents? Well, previously we saw that the basic idea of an agent is it's a system that's capable of autonomous action, autonomous decision making, in order to achieve delegated goals. Um, but I argue that there are systems like thermostats that have those attributes, they're capable of acting autonomously to achieve delegated goals, although the decision making is so simple that we certainly wouldn't think of them as being intelligent. So what kind of attributes are we thinking about when we talk about intelligent agents? And what I would argue is that we typically think about three attributes associated with this notion of agency. And the attributes that I'm going to argue for are the notions of reactiveness, proactiveness, and social ability. So what I'm going to do in this video is just explain what I mean by these three attributes and why they're important. Okay, so reactivity. Okay, reactivity simply means realising when the world has changed so as to mess up your plans, so as to make your plans uh, unachievable, and responding, replanning, reorganising your activities, responding in time for those responses to be useful. That's the core of reactivity. So, let me give you an example. This morning I have to get to work. So how am I going to get to work? I plan when I wake up to catch a bus. So I walk to the bus stop and I wait for the bus, but no bus turns up. Okay. What do I do? Well, I don't do a core dump. I don't show a blue screen of death. Uh, I don't throw an exception. What I do is I form an alternative plan. Okay, the bus didn't turn up, so what is an alternative plan? I'll hail a taxi. Okay. So this is forming an alternative plan when you realise that your current plan, that is catching a bus, is just not going, to, uh, is not going to work. Reactivity is important because most of the environments in which we think about putting agents are dynamic. They're changing. They're changing in ways beyond our agents' control. 
If we knew that the environment was exactly as we imagined it to be, that is, if we knew that the bus was going to turn up on time, then we wouldn't have to worry about reactivity. Okay? If we knew exactly what the effect of our actions were going to be, then we wouldn't have to worry about reactivity. But we don't. Things change in ways beyond our control. And sometimes the actions that we perform don't have the consequences, the effects, that we would like them to have. And in that situation, we need to monitor our environment. We need to look around us as we're doing things in order to decide whether or not we need to change our current plan, or whether or not we can continue with our existing plan, whether or not our existing plan is going to achieve the goal that we want it to achieve. So what we're talking about is building software systems that can do that. Now if you think about a, a function in C, or a procedure in Pascal, or a method in a language like Java, Think about the way that they execute. What they do, essentially, is they blindly execute. You start at the first line of code and you carry on executing. Okay? Now, we typically write a procedure or a function or a method in order to achieve some goal. And in computer science terminology, that goal is called the post-condition of the procedure, the post-condition of the function. Okay? What our procedure doesn't do, what our method doesn't do, is it's executing, is stop and look around and say, am I still going to accomplish my post condition? Okay? Am I still going to achieve the goal that I was written to achieve? But actually, if you think about us in real life, that's exactly what we do. As I'm executing my plan to get to work, I stop and I look around. Is this going to work or do I need to replan? Okay, so those are the kinds of capabilities that we're thinking about when we think about reactivity. The idea of stopping, looking around you, deciding whether or not your current plan is going to have its desired effect. And if not, then responding to those changes in time for them to be useful. Well, reactivity in some sense is, is very easy. You can build a very reactive system just with a lookup table. And the lookup table has just what's called stimulus response rules. It says, if I see this stimulus, if my environment looks like this, then do this corresponding action. And in order to decide what to do, all you have to do is go down the lookup table until you find a situation that matches your current, until you find a, a left-hand side on that lookup table that matches your current situation, and then perform the corresponding action. And it's computationally easy to do. But actually, uh, that will give you reactivity, that will give you reactive agents, but actually the point is we want agents to do things for us. We want them to achieve our delegated goals. And this kind of stimulus response type behavior is not the most effective way of building uh, uh, such agents, agents that can exhibit goal-directed behaviour. So when we talk about proactiveness, what we mean is exhibiting goal-directed behaviour, capable of working towards a goal, being delegated a goal, and then deciding how best to try to achieve that goal. That's what we mean by proactiveness, we mean goal-directed behaviour. So we've got two properties so far, reactiveness and proactiveness. Reactiveness, realising when the environment's changed, modifying your behaviour accordingly, so you're still going to achieve your delegated goal. Proactiveness, systematically working to achieve your goals. Okay? Well, uh, if, you, if you've ever worked in uh, an environment with a manager, okay, where somebody's been managing you, you will realise that managers come in two flavours. There is reactive manager and proactive manager. And what reactive manager does is he continually responds to events and is never capable of setting the agenda, and never manages to achieve anything, just because every day when you get into the office, they've got a new plan, they've got a new direction, they're going somewhere different. Okay? And that's reactive manager. And then at the other extreme, you've got proactive manager. He sets this goal, this is what we're going to do, and you're all, ge you're all geared up to, do to working towards that goal, even if the goal becomes irrelevant. Okay? Even if it becomes irrelevant or unachievable. Okay? So what we value in human managers is the ability to get a good balance right between being reactive and proactive. So, for example, setting a plan, devising a plan of activity that's going to achieve your goal, and working towards that plan, but still looking around you and realising when that plan is no longer going to work, when you need to change that plan, when you need to change your behaviour accordingly. Okay? So getting a good balance right between being reactive, that is, responding to changes in your environment, and between being proactive, that is, exhibiting goal-directed behaviour. 
Now, this is something that people don't find it easy to do, right? If you, and if you've ever worked with reactive and proactive manager, you will appreciate the limitations of those two extremes of behaviours. So it's, it's a property that we value highly uh, in humans when they can get that balance right between being reactive and proactive. What we're going to be talking about is building software that can be both reactive and proactive. So just as it's, it's not easy to build you to have humans that have those kinds of attributes, it's not so easy to build software that has them. But we will see some of the main approaches that have been developed to building software with those attributes. Then the final property I want to talk about is social ability. So in a sense, social ability is trivial for computers, right? Because everything's connected to the internet these days, and social ability is just communicating. But uh, when we talk about social ability in multi-agent systems, we're talking about something richer than that. We're not just talking about exchanging bits, getting a bit from one agent to another, from one system to another. We're talking about the kinds of social ability that we have as humans. Okay? The ability to, not just to communicate in terms of exchanging bits, but the ability to coordinate, to negotiate and to cooperate with other agents. That is, when you have a goal which is shared with another agent, then the ability to cooperate with them, to work with them, to try to achieve that goal. When you need to reach agreement on a matter of common interest, the ability to negotiate, to have software agents that can negotiate with other agents. Okay? Those are the kinds of social ability that we are talking about. And this is particularly important if we think that the delegated goals that our agents have are in some sense in conflict with one another, that is, they're different goals. In situations like that, then you need the ability to negotiate, to reach an agreement on some disputed matter. Okay, so the kinds of ability then, in order for an agent to be uh, what we'll call an intelligent agent, although I'm aware that the term intelligent here, we need to wrap that in scare quotes a little bit, the three key behaviours are reactive, proactive and social. Reactive capable of realising when the environment has changed and responding, modifying your behaviour accordingly. Proactive, capable of exhibiting goal-directed behaviour, being given a delegated goal and systematically working to achieve that. Getting a good balance right between being reactive and proactive. Okay? And then finally, social ability, the ability to cooperate, coordinate and negotiate with other software agents. In this video, I want to say a few words about how the notion of agents that we've introduced in preceding videos and preceding chapters of the book uh, is related to existing software technology, and in particular, objects, as in object-oriented programming. So let's start by reminding ourselves exactly what an object is in the sense of Java or C++ or Smalltalk. So the first important property that an object has is that it encapsulates some state. So the notion of encapsulation is absolutely fundamental to object-oriented programming. What it means is that there is some component of an object, some set of variables within the object, which is only accessible to the object itself. Okay? And this means that other, other uh, objects in the software world can't interact directly with that state. It's hidden away inside an object, it's private to that object. And we indicate the state that we encapsulate in Java by using the keyword private. So an object, object encapsulates some state. One way of describing that is that you can say that an object has some kind of autonomy over its state. It has control over its own state. One idea that was fundamental and very visible in early object-oriented programming languages like Smalltalk, but that which has become a little bit blurred in contemporary object-oriented programming languages like uh, Java, is the notion of message passing. So in Smalltalk, it was very much a first-class idea in the language, the idea that objects communicate by passing messages to one another. And what this idea of message passing has evolved to in modern object-oriented programming languages is the idea of method invocation. But you can think of the idea of a one object invoking a method upon another as sending it a message. And that notion is very explicit, as I say, in languages like Smalltalk. And the third uh, notion that's, that's there in object-oriented programming is the idea that agents can do things. They have some methods. And we can think of those methods, the interface of the object, as being the actions that the object 
can perform. Okay, so an object, in the sense of object-oriented programming, there is some private state hidden away inside the object which is not directly accessible uh, outside that object. Okay, so an object has autonomy over its state. Uh, it communicates via message passing, and message passing in languages like Java is represented by method invocation. But in languages like Smalltalk, the notion of message passing is very explicit. And then finally, the object has an interface, and the interface defines the actions that the object can perform. So, uh, let's try and consider then uh, how this relates to the uh, notion of an agent. So, the best way of explaining this is as follows. Suppose we have two objects. We have object O1 over here and object O2 over here. And this guy, object O1, provides some publicly accessible method. That is, within his interface he has some action uh, that, that, that is available, some service which is available to other objects. So this guy over here, object O2, knows about object O1. He can directly invoke that method uh, upon object O1. So he can send him a message saying, perform that method. So here's the question, where does the decision lie about whether that method actually gets invoked? Is it with this guy, with this object, or is it with this one? Well, I would argue that the decision about whether to invoke that method lies with the person that invokes it. If this object provides a public method which is available to others, a service which is available publicly, then he has no control over whether that object gets invoked or not. It just does if this guy decides to invoke it. So, in that sense, objects are not very autonomous. They have no control over their, own, over their own actions in the way that we've been talking about agents having choices about what actions to perform. Uh, think about this in the agent world. Is it the case now if we've got two agents, uh, let's think about them as being real individuals, about you and me, is it the idea that you, is, do we have the idea that you can directly invoke a method upon me? So suppose you want to try and invoke the buy me a beer method on me. Am I likely to respond to that? Well, I might buy you a beer, I might ask for some money, or I could ask you to, I could say can, if you'll buy me a beer next week. But the point is, I have control over whether or not I actually buy you a beer. So we don't think about agents as invoking methods upon one another. One another. We think about them typically as requesting one another to perform actions. Uh, if we go back to the idea of objects as encapsulating some state, well, similarly, we have the same idea in the agent world. I have some private state, some, some beliefs about how the world is, and it's not the case that you can directly manipulate that state. So for the same reason, we think about agents as informing one another of things and not directly manipulating the state that we have. So while objects in, have some notion of autonomy, they have some autonomy over their state, they don't really have autonomy over their behaviour. Okay? They provide some public services, and those services can be invoked by anybody who's got a handle on that object. Whereas we think about agents as embodying a stronger notion of autonomy than objects do. So an agent can decide for itself whether or not to perform an action on the request of another. Beyond that, though, we've been talking about uh, agents as being reactive, about being proactive, and about being social. Those, those, those concepts have no parallel in the object-oriented world. They simply don't appear. They're nothing to do with object-oriented programming. Okay? So the, the OO model has nothing to say about being reactive or proactive or social. This doesn't mean, of course, that you can't build those kind of capabilities using object-oriented programming languages. Of course you can, but the point is that the standard object model has nothing to say about it. And then finally, as we described in previous videos and in earlier parts of the book, we think about an agent being in a close coupled loop with its environment, performing this sense, decide, act loop, continually going around this sense, decide, act loop. So, Agents are active entities. They're continually deciding what to do next, what is the next action to perform. Whereas with objects, we think about them more as being service providers. I provide this service and I'm not doing anything until somebody invokes a method on me, tells me to provide that service. Okay, and in, in agents, in contrast, we think of as being active things. So in summary, Agents are autonomous. They embody a stronger notion of autonomy than objects do. Or objects have autonomy over their state, the state that they encapsulate, but we think about agents as having autonomy over their behaviour. We think about agents as having these reactive, proactive and social behaviours that we've talked about previously, 
Uh, and finally, we think about agents as being active entities, continually deciding what to do next, whereas we think about objects as being essentially passive service providers, waiting to be told what to do. So that, in my view, sums up the main differences between objects and agents. In this video, I want to say a few words about the environments that agents inhabit. So far, when we've defined an agent, we've talked about it as being a computer system which is situated in some environment. So when we talk about an agent being situated in an environment, we mean that it's doing things, it's acting directly upon that environment. It's not disembodied from it. It's not giving advice to a person who then acts on the environment. The agent is performing actions on the environment itself. It is directly acting upon the environment. That's what we mean by situated. Uh, we've seen a couple of examples of environments so far, so let's just remind ourselves what those are. Firstly, we can think of agents as being situated in the physical world. And by the physical world, I mean the world that we all inhabit, the physical world that you and I operate in. Uh, so agents, autonomous agents that inhabit the physical world are robots, essentially. They're directly doing things to the physical world. So we can think of unmanned autonomous vehicles as being autonomous agents in, uh, in the physical world. But as well as having agents that operate in the physical world, we can think of agents that operate in virtual environments, software worlds, like um, computer operating systems, like a Unix operating system or a Windows operating system, uh, or network uh, environments where an agent is inhabiting a computer network. So we think of an agent as going through this continual sense, decide, act loop, uh, an, an agent that is inhabiting a physical environment will have sensors like infrared rangefinders and sonar which give it information about its environment. And the actions it can perform are things like moving around the environment or maybe it has some uh, uh, actuators, some manipulators to actually manipulate objects in the environment. What about software agents though? Well, imagine an agent that's in a software environment like the Unix operating system. Well, the sensors that uh, such an agent has are things like Unix instructions like LS, which give you information about the operating system. So the Unix LS command, just all it does is it tells you the files that are in your current directory. And that action is a sensing action, it's giving you information about the environment. And there are all sorts of other Unix commands, like the PS command, which gives you information about the processors that are currently operating in, uh, in the operating system. So those actions are giving an agent information about its environment. What about the actions that a software agent can perform? Well, we can think of a, a, a Unix agent as performing actions like the RM instruction, which removes a file, or the MV, the move instruction, which moves a file from one place in the operating system to another. So those kinds of commands are the actions that a Unix agent could have to manipulate, to change its environment. And of course, those actions can succeed or fail. For example, if you try and move a file that you don't own in Unix, then the, the action will fail. You won't be allowed to do it. You can try to do it, but you won't be allowed to. So in general, then, agents can inhabit the physical world, real-world environments of various different kinds. And they could be you know, here on this planet or uh, uh, autonomous space probes, you can imagine, uh, operating on, on remote and distant planets. Uh, you can think about agents as inhabiting uh, software environments like computer operating systems and networks. Stuart Russell and Peter Norvig in their introductory AI textbook, AI and Modern Approach, suggested the following classification scheme for agents. I'm just going to go through these, these properties. So the first property of environments that they talked about was whether an environment was accessible or inaccessible. So all this means is whether or not an agent can get sufficient information from its environment in order to make the right decision. That is, whether it can get complete, accurate, up-to-date information about its environment, or at least information of sufficient quality and timeliness to make the right kind of decision. And if the answer to that question is yes, it can get that information, then we say the environment is accessible. If it can't, then we say it's inaccessible. And fairly obviously, the more accessible an environment is, the easier it's going to be for an agent to operate in that environment. The second property is determinism versus non-determinism. 
which is related to, but not quite the same way as the term is used in automata theory, when we talk about non-deterministic automata. When we talk about determinism uh, as respect, in respect to environments, what we mean is this. An environment is deterministic if, whenever I choose to perform an action, I know exactly what the outcome of that action is going to be. There is a single outcome to that action, and I know exactly what it's going to be. If an environment is non-deterministic, then what that means is that performing the same action, there are multiple possible outcomes to that action, and I don't know which of those is going to result. So it's the same action, but multiple possible outcomes, and I don't know which one will actually happen. Uh, so clearly, the more deterministic an environment is, the easier it's going to be, in general, for an agent to operate in that environment. The more non-deterministic it is, the more unpredictable it is, in some sense, the harder it's going to be for an agent to operate in it. Episodic versus non-episodic. Well, this really relates to the kinds of tasks that an agent carries out in an environment. And what episodic means is the following. An environment or task in an environment is episodic if it's, if it's constructed of a series of discrete Episode. So there's an episode here where the agent has some subtask to perform, and then an episode over here where it has another subtask, and these two things don't interfere with one another. That is, if you fail here or succeed here, it doesn't affect whether or not you fail or succeed over here. If, in contrast, what you do over here affects your ability to succeed over here, or later on when you're carrying out other tasks, then we say the environment is non-episodic. So in an episodic environment, or task carried out in an uh, environment, uh, we, what happens is we carry out the task in a number of discrete episodes which don't interfere with one another. Okay. And in general, episodic is easier than non-episodic, broadly speaking. Because in, in an episodic environment, you don't have to worry about how the actions that you perform now are going to interfere with what you do in the future. And then static versus dynamic is the final part of the classification. So intuitively, an environment is static if you are the only person that's operating on that environment. If the only way that things can change is by the actions that you perform. In that case, you say uh, the environment is static. And again, the point is, if the environment is static, then it's essentially predictable. You know it's only going to change as a result of your actions. A dynamic environment is one where there are multiple processes or multiple agents operating within the environment. Things can change uh, in ways beyond your control. You don't know exactly how the environment is going to be tomorrow. So I tend to use the following sort of slogan to summarise this. A static environment is one where your keys are always where you left them. In a dynamic environment, somebody else can come in and pick up and move your keys and the next morning you can't find them. So, to summarise, in general, we have environments that could be, for example, the physical world environment, in which we have robots that are operating on the environment, but they could also be virtual environments, operating systems, computer networks. And then we've got this classification scheme of environments, accessible versus inaccessible, relating to the information that you get about the environment, or can get about the environment, where accessible, roughly speaking, is easier. Deterministic versus non-deterministic, whether or not you know the actions uh, will have a single effect or whether there are multiple possible effects of an action. Episodic versus non-episodic, whether or not you have to worry about how the actions that you perform now will interfere with the actions you can perform in the future. And finally, static versus dynamic, whether or not you are the only actor in an environment or whether there are other processes, other agents operating upon that environment. In this video, I want to talk about an idea which is commonplace within the autonomous agents and multi-agent systems community, but which people outside this community are often uncomfortable with or don't really understand terribly well. So I want to explain what this idea is and to try and justify it. And the idea is talking about computer processes, agents, as if they have mental state, as if they have cognitive state. Uh, and the idea is the following. When we talk about the behaviour of agents in the real world, people like you or me, uh, we use statements like the following. Janine took her umbrella because she believed it was raining and she wanted to stay dry. So what we're doing in this sentence here is we're taking an agent, Janine, and we're attributing to her beliefs, 
and desires. We're attributing these beliefs and desires because we're not saying that these things actually exist, but it makes sense for us to talk about Janine as if she has these beliefs and desires. We never had any formal training in these kinds of statements, but most of us seem to be familiar with and comfortable with them. Okay? And because we never had any formal training, this isn't a formal thing, we call this folk psychology, the idea of predicting and explaining the behaviour of rational agents in the real world by attributing to them beliefs and desires and then assuming that they're going to act rationally to try to accomplish their desires given that they have these beliefs. And this idea of talking about agents in terms of mental states like beliefs and desires was called the intentional stance by uh, Daniel Dennett. And he is a philosopher who coined the term intentional system to describe entities whose behaviour can be predicted by the method of attributing beliefs, desires and rational acumen, as we did with that statement about Janine on the previous slide. And he talks about different grades of intentional systems. So here's a quote from Daniel Dennett. A first order intentional system has beliefs and desires, but it, does, it has no beliefs and desires about beliefs and desires. A second order intentional system, in contrast, is more sophisticated. It has beliefs and desires, and no doubt other intentional states like fears and wants, about beliefs and desires, and other intentional states, both those of its others and of its own. So a first order intentional system has beliefs and desires, but it doesn't have beliefs and desires about beliefs and desires. A second order intentional system has beliefs and desires about the beliefs and desires of itself and of others. So that's the notion of an intentional system. Now, uh, we're going to be talking about computer processes as if they have these mental states. So we have to justify that in some sense. We have to look at whether or not it's legitimate or useful to talk about machines as if they have mental states. And John McCarthy, one of the key figures in AI research, uh, came up with the following quote to talk about this idea. To ascribe beliefs, free will, intentions, consciousness, abilities or wants to a machine is legitimate when such an ascription expresses the same information about this machine that it expresses about a person. It's useful when it helps us to understand the structure of the machine, its past or future behaviour, or how to repair or improve it. It's perhaps never logically required, even for humans, but expressing reasonably briefly what is actually known about the state of the machine in a particular situation may, may require mental qualities or qualities isomorphic to them. Theories of belief, knowledge and wanting can be constructed for machines in a simpler setting than for humans and later applied to humans. Description of mental qualities is most straightforward for machines of known structure, such as thermostats and computer operating systems, but it's most useful when it's applied to entities whose structure is incompletely known. So let's try and take apart what he's saying here. So the first thing he's saying is that this ascribing beliefs and desires and so on to machines or computer processes is legitimate when it expresses the same information about the machine that it expresses about a person which gives us a kind of test for whether or not uh, something has, for example, a desire to stay dry. If, if something has a desire to stay dry, then we expect it to act so as to stay dry. So if it believes it's going to rain, we expect it to take an umbrella or to take some action to keep it, it dry. So it's legitimate when it expresses the same information about a machine that it expresses about a person. If a robot, if we say a robot wants to stay dry, then we expect it to act so as to try and stay dry. It's useful when it helps us to understand the structure of the machine, its past or future behaviour, or how to repair or improve it. So if it helps us to predict the behaviour of a computer process, if it allows us to predict the behaviour of a computer process without knowing anything about how that computer process is actually operating, so where the structure is incompletely known, then it's being useful. Okay? It's useful when it allows us to predict its behaviour even when we don't have any knowledge of the actual program itself. It's never logically required, even for humans. Well, what McCarthy's saying here is that there are multiple possible descriptions of the behaviour of a system. We don't need the intentional stance. We can use other descriptions. For example, ultimately, people like you and I, we're just a bunch of atoms. We can appeal to some lower level 
physical description of what's going on in order to uh, uh, describe and predict our behaviour. But, as McCarthy says, expressing reasonably briefly what is actually known about the state of the machine may require mental qualities or qualities isomorphic to them. So, when you try and understand what a computer is doing, it's very natural to use language like uh, the computer wants you to type in your password. The computer doesn't know where you want to put this file. Well, we intuitively talk about the computer as if it has desires to find out things from us or doesn't know things about us. And the point there is, there is an alternative explanation. We can appeal to the description of a computer in terms of ones and zeros and its circuits and so on, but expressing reasonably briefly about the, the behaviour of a computer in this kind of setting, expressing reasonably briefly is not going to be done with such a description. So here, the mental state description seems to be uh, 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 much more useful. Um, so what can be described? What kinds of machine can be described by the intentional stance? Well, even very simple machines. Here's a quote from uh, Yo Shoen. So Yo Shoen says, consider a light switch. It's perfectly coherent to treat a light switch as a very cooperative agent with the capability of transmitting current at will, who invariably transmits current when it believes we want it transmitted and not otherwise. Flicking the switch is simply our way of communicating our desires. So here we're talking about a light switch as if it is an agent. But is that a useful thing to do? Well, most adults would think that description is, is extremely silly. Why? Because it doesn't buy us anything, as Sherwin points out. We essentially understand the mechanism, in terms of the sort of even very naive understandings of physics and current that's being transmitted, sufficiently to have a simpler mechanistic description of its behaviour. And understanding a light switch in terms of current is in many ways more useful than this kind of uh, intentional stance description, because it allows us to predict that if we spill water on the light switch, we'll get an electric shock. So, the more we know about a system, typically, the less we need these intentional stance descriptions. But, so, the less we know about them, the more useful these intentional stance descriptions are. And with computers, there are extremely complicated artifacts appealing to physical descriptions or design level descriptions of the behaviour of a computer just becomes uh, too much to handle. So here, the intentional sense can be a useful abstraction tool. It doesn't require us to know about how the circuitry of the computer works. It just lets us talk about the behaviour of this entity as if it was a rational agent. It has some beliefs, it has some desires, so we predict it will, tr it will behave to try to accomplish its desires given that it, look, it thinks the world looks like its beliefs. We don't need to know about the low-level construction, the circuits, the ones and zeros in memory. It's an abstraction tool. And computer science is all about abstraction tools. What I want to do in this video is introduce uh, a small amount of mathematical notation, nothing for you to worry about, which is going to allow us to explore a few of the issues surrounding this idea of putting agents in their environments and the decision making that they do. So let's have a look at the components of this model that we're going to use. So the first thing that we do is we want to model environment states. So the idea is we're going to have a set, big E here, which is going to be the set of all possible configurations of the environment. So if the environment was a computer program, then it's all possible configurations of the, the program's memory, for example. Uh, if it's a game of chess, then these are all possible uh, configurations of the game of chess, all possible situations within, uh, uh, that could arise within a game of chess. We're not going to dig down, though, into exactly what these environment states are. We're just going to keep it at that level of abstraction and assume we've got this set of environment states, this big E here being this set of environment states. Well, we've already said agents are things that do things to their environment, and to model the things that they're doing, we're going to have this set AC of possible actions. 
So the, the members of this set e, AC we denote by alpha, alpha prime, alpha one, and so on. And again, we're not worrying about exactly what those actions are. In, for example, a Unix software environment, these actions could be removing files or moving a file from one place to another or processing a file in some way. If the environment was a physical environment, then they could be uh, actuator actions, the robot picking something up and moving it around, or maybe moving from one location to another, and so on. But we'll keep it abstract, we'll just assume there is this set AC of actions that our agent can perform. So E, all possible configurations of the environment, AC, the actions that our agent can do in this environment. So we earlier talked about the idea that an agent goes through this sense, decide, act loop, this continual loop of looking at its environment, deciding what to do, uh, then performing that action which changes the environment in some way, then the agent observes its environment and decides what to do and so on. So this leads naturally to the idea of a run. And a run, we use lowercase r to denote runs, Runs are just interleaved sequences of environment state action, environment state action, environment state action. So the environment starts off in some state E0, so we're always going to use little e0 to denote the initial state of the environment. And to keep things simple, we assume there is just one initial state of the environment possible. In principle, there could be others, but we'll keep it simple. On the basis of that initial state, the agent looks at its environment and decides what to do. It chooses an action, in this case it chooses alpha zero, performs that action, and then we use this arrow to indicate that the state is transformed from one state to another. It transforms this, this action, alpha zero, transforms, changes environment state E zero into environment state E one. So then again, the agent goes through its sense, decide, act loop. It looks at its environment again, decides what to do, chooses alpha 1, which changes the environment state again to E2, and so on. Okay? So when you put an agent together with an environment, and the agent continually going around that sense, decide, act loop, you lead, this leads to the idea of a run. Okay, uh, and we use this calligraphic R to denote the set of all possible runs over some set of environment states and actions. We're going to not mention those, just assume that they're given. Uh, then we use another little bit of notation here to indicate whether the runs that end with an action, R superscript AC, and the runs that end with an environment state, R superscript E. So R superscript AC is just a run where the last thing that happened was the agent chose to do an action. R superscript E is a run where the last thing that happened was the agent, where the environment changed state. Okay, so the key thing we want to do then, when we describe an environment, the main thing that we want to do is describe the effects that actions have on an environment. And we do this with what's called a state transformer function. So tau here, tau for transformer, uh, is a state transformer function. So all a state transformer function does is takes as input a run, a history, where the last thing that happened was the agent chose to perform an action, and it gives as outputs the environment states that could result from the performance of that action given the history of the system as described in the run in the input. So it takes a run where the last thing that happened was the agent chose to perform an action and gives as output the set of states that could result. So this notation here, this P of E, is just a power set of the set of environment states. It gives as output a set of states, those which could result. So there are two assumptions implicit within this definition. The first is that state transformer functions are history dependent. That is, in order to decide what the next states of the environment could be, a state transformer function looks at the whole history of the system so far. And the second assumption is that environments are non-deterministic. There are multiple possible states that could result from our agent performing to choose one of the same action given the same run so far. So there are multiple possible states that could result. So the output of a state transformer function is a set of states. Okay, um, what happens if this state transformer function gives us output the empty set? Well, in this case, we, say it's, we think of it as being game over. It's like the run is terminated, the system is terminated, that's it. The, 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 the whole thing is over. So to completely describe an environment then, we've got a set of environment states, E. So these are all configurations of the game of chess. 
uh, an initial environment state E0, that's how the game of chess starts off, and then the state transformer function tau just says how the game of chess changes, how the configuration of the chessboard changes as a result of people performing moves. So that's those three components, the set of environment states, the initial state, the state transformer function, that's all we need to describe uh, an environment. What about agents? Well, we model agents in a similar but slightly more restricted way. We model an agent as a function which takes as input uh, a run where the last thing that happened was the environment changed state. So the agent function takes as input a run where the last thing that happened was the environment changed state. And it gives as output an action, the action that the agent would choose to perform, given it had seen that run where the last thing that happened was the environment change state. So the input is just a run where the last thing that happened was the environment change state. The output is a single action, and that's the key difference we assume between agents and environments. We're assuming that agents here have to be deterministic. Given the same sequence of events, they will choose the same action. Uh, so that's how we model an agent. So this isn't telling you how agents go about making that decision. It's just saying in each possible situation that could arise, each possible history of the system that could arise, this is what our agent would choose to do. So we just model it uh, at that very, very abstract level. So that's the basic model of agents and environments. We, when we talk about a system, then we're talking about an agent together with an environment. Okay? We talk about a system as being an agent together with an environment. And when you put an agent in an environment, it will generate a set of runs. These are all the possible runs that could occur if this agent is placed in this environment. There's more than one possible run that could occur because our environments are assumed to be non-deterministic. For the same action that an agent chooses to perform, there are multiple possible outcomes and hence multiple possible runs. So we use this notation R of AG and N to denote the set of possible runs of our agent uh, in, our, in the environment. In previous videos, uh, we introduced a very high level model of agents and the decision making that they do. Uh, and it was very high level in the sense that it didn't make any kind of commitments or tell you very much about how you might actually go about implementing uh, such agents. It just tried to model the decision making that agents do at a very, very high level. So what we're now going to do in this video is to start to decompose that high level model into a number of subsystems. Uh, and this decomposition isn't going to be complete because you still won't be able to implement an agent after you've seen this decomposition, but it will give you a flavour of some of the kinds of subsystems that you will find in actual agents. And in later parts of the book and in later videos, we will see some concrete instantiations of these subsystems. We will see exactly what they look like in, in real agents. So, the first idea that I'm going to introduce uh, is that it's not really a decomposition at all, but the idea that our agent's decision making is what's called purely reactive. And these are very, very simple kinds of agents that are simply responding to their environment. So they're not attempting to do any kind of reasoning about what action to perform or any sort of high level problem solving or thinking about what action to perform. They're simply responding to the environment. Okay, so purely reactive agents are essentially just lookup tables, or rather the decision making in a purely reactive agent is essentially just a lookup table. What our agent does is it has a lookup table where on the left hand side of that lookup table are environment states, that is possible configurations of the environment, and then on the right hand side of that lookup table are corresponding actions. So in order to decide what to do, all our agent does is it looks down this lookup table until it finds an environment state which matches what it sees in the environment at the moment, and if it finds a match, then it performs the corresponding action. So decision making is just look down this lookup table until you find an environment, until you find something which matches what you see in the environment and perform the corresponding action. So formally, we model these purely reactive agents via these, these what we call action functions. 
which simply take as input an environment state and give as output an action. So this is the left hand side of the lookup table and this is the right hand side of the lookup table. So this action function takes as input an environment state and simply says, okay, if this is the state that you see in your environment, then this is the action that you perform. Uh, so a thermostat, for example, can be thought of as a very simple kind of one of these purely reactive agents. What does a thermostat do? Well, it looks at its environment state, and it's really got only two notions of environment state. It's got temperature okay or temperature not okay. And if the temperature is okay, that is in, in an acceptable range, then switch the heating off. If it's not acceptable, then switch the heating on. So all this agent has to do is try to find a match between uh, uh, it's the environment state that it sees and whether or not the temperature is okay or not and perform the corresponding action. So very, very simple kinds of decision making in purely reactive agents. But for moderately complex tasks, you know, anything that's beyond trivial, uh, building these kind of purely reactive agents, trying to build them in this kind of lookup table way, while it's actually very efficient in terms of the amount of time it takes to make a decision, because all you're doing is looking down the table, Actually, building them that way is just not practical. So what do we do instead? What we do instead is we start to decompose our agents into subsystems. And the top level decomposition that you can think about is into perception and action subsystems. So here, what we've done is we've broken our agents' decision making down into two parts. There's a perception part and an action part. So how to explain uh, the perception part of an agent? Well, the idea is, the way to think about this is, uh, think about a mobile robot that's busy moving around the real world, and imagine that it has some sensors on it. So it could be a video camera, or more likely, an infrared rangefinder, or a laser rangefinder, or a sonar, or something like that. And that's giving the output of that system, is giving the agent some information, some perceptual data, it's giving the agent some perceptual data about its environment. And we call that perceptual data a percept. A percept is a piece of perceptual data. So we model then this C function, this perceptual component of our agent, we model that as a function which just says, okay, if this is the environment state I'm in, then this is the percept that I'm going to produce. So the video camera is looking at the environment and it's producing as output a percept. So PER here is the set of all possible percepts, the set of all possible bits of perceptual data. So then the action selection subsystem that we think of an agent having, previously when we looked at an agent's in the very abstract model, we looked at an agent's decision making, what we did is we said it looked at the whole history of the system so far, environment state action, environment state action, the whole history of that system, and then decided what action to perform. Well here, what we're saying is it looks at all, the, it takes into account all the percepts that it has received. So if I have received this percept, then this one, then this one, then this is the action that I'm going to perform. Whereas if I've received this percept, then this percept, then this percept, then this is the action that I'm going to perform. So it just takes as input the action selection system, takes as input a sequence of percepts and decides what action to perform on that basis. So we're dividing an agent just in this top level way down into perception and action. The output of the perception system uh, is a percept, a piece of perceptual data. Well, still, of course, this isn't giving us really terribly many hints about how to go about actually implementing these. So let's do a further very natural decomposition and start to think about agents as maintaining state. So the idea now is an agent has an internal state which it can update every decision cycle. Every time it goes through this sense, decide, act decision cycle, it's going to update its internal state. So the perception system is the same as before, it's just producing this uh, percept, this, but now there is this next state function, very similar to automata line models. The next state function says Okay, if this is the perceptual information that I'm getting, this is the input from my environment that I'm perceiving, and this is the current state that I'm in, then this is going to be my next state. So think about this next state function as deciding what to record about the state of the environment. 
Anything uh, that the agent wants to remember has to be written into that state. And then all the action selection subsystem does is says, well, if my state looks like this, then this is the action that I'm going to perform. So the action selection subsystem, all it does is it looks at the internal state and on the basis of that internal state decides what action to perform. So the basic operation of our agent is look at the environment, which generates a percept, a bit of perceptual data. Update my internal state. And then this updating process takes as input both the current percept that I'm getting and my previous state, and that results in a new state being generated, a new internal state. The action selection function just looks at the internal state and decides what action to perform. Okay, so the next state function then, big I here is the set of all possible internal states. The next state function says, okay, if I'm currently in this internal state, and this is the perceptual input that I'm getting, then this is going to be the next state. So it takes two inputs, uh, the current internal state, the current percept that's being, uh, that's being given, and it returns as output the next state that our agent is going to go in. Okay, and then the action selection function just says, well, if this is my current internal state, then this is the action that I'm going to perform. So the agent control loop is just repeat this loop forever, look at the environment through my C function, update my internal state via my next function, which, which says what I'm going to remember, choose an action to perform via my action function and perform it, and just continually go through that loop. Now, of course, what we haven't said in any detail is exactly what those internal states are going to be, what those percepts are going to be. These are exactly the issues that we're going to explore in the future. So far, we've been talking about the idea of delegating tasks to agents without actually saying anything about how this should be done. And one key question is exactly how do we describe what it is we want an agent to do for us when we delegate a task? Uh, well, one kind of simple way to tell an agent what to do, how to delegate a task, is to simply give it a program. And the task of the agent is to execute that program. But a program is a very low-level description of a task. And if you think about the way that we delegate tasks in the real world, uh, for example, when you ask your secretary to book a flight for you, you certainly don't give them a program that they, that they uh, execute. So what we're after is some way of delegating a task to an agent, describing what it is we want an agent to do without telling it how to do it. So describing a task that we want an agent to carry out without explicitly telling the agent exactly what it is to have to do in order to accomplish that task. And that is exactly the point about autonomy that we've been talking about in previous lectures. The agent figures out for itself how to accomplish this delegated task without us having to tell it. So this is the area of what we'll call task specifications. So the first idea that we have is we delegate a task to an agent intuitively by describing how good or bad specific environment states are. And the task of the agent is to bring about good, highly valued environment states. So formally we do this through what are called utility functions. And utility here just means value. So a utility function gives us the value uh, of, uh, of something. And the first kind of utility function uh, that we're going to look at is utility function u. Just take as input an environment state and give as output a real number. And the larger that number, the better the environment state is, as far as we are concerned. So intuitively, given such a utility function, the task of the agent is to bring about environment states that have the highest value. So this is a very simple and very high level way uh, of describing a task for an agent. And crucially, it doesn't tell the agent how it is to bring about those environment states. Well, uh, one difficult issue with these very simple kinds of utility functions is that what we're, we're assigning values to is environment states, that is to snapshots of uh, the environment. And if I give this particular environment state a particular value, it doesn't say anything about the value of environment states that come before or about environment states that come after. Um, so inherently we're taking a very short-term view 
by assigning values to individual environment states. So how do you lift these values of environment states to values of overall runs? That is, if you know the values of individual environment states that occur in a run, how do you then compute the value of the run itself? So different settings might have some answers. For example, in some setting, maybe what you're interested in is the, the value of the, uh, uh, the smallest valued environment state that occurs on that run, or the largest, or the sum of the values uh, of all the environment states that occur, or maybe it's the average. Um, sometimes there will be simply no way of doing it at all. So inherently there is a difficulty with these kind of utility functions that what we're doing is we're assigning values to individual environment states, not to runs. Uh, so, a very natural thing to do then is to think about utility functions over runs. So the second type of utility function that we're going to look at is a utility function that takes as input a run and gives as output a real number. So now what we're doing is for every possible run, we're saying how much it would be worth to me if this run occurs or this run occurs or this run occurs. So we're inherently then taking a long-term view. Um, one generic problem with these utility function type approaches is that, to put it bluntly, people find it very difficult to think in, in terms of numbers. So when I delegate a task like buy me a, a flight to Toronto or arrange me a flight to Toronto with my secretary, I'm not specifying that task in terms of, of numbers and that's not how I formulate the task. So this is a generic difficulty with these kind of numeric approaches. Nevertheless, the approach works well in certain circumstances. So, for example, if you can give a precise numeric interpretation to utility, for example, if, if utility is simply the amount of money that's earned, okay, then the approach can work, can work very, very well. Okay, so we've seen two types of utility functions, utility functions over environment states, utility functions over runs. Let's now introduce a special case of utility functions over runs that are called predicate task specifications. So a predicate is just something that's true or false, and the idea of a predicate task specification psi is that it looks at a run and simply says whether that run is a bad one, gives it the value 0, or a good one, gives it the value 1. So these are special cases of utility functions over runs, it's just that the range of these utility functions is just the set 0, 1. Either a run is bad, 0, or good, 1. Okay, we can, we can naturally think of them uh, as being predicates when we value uh, falsity at zero and truth at one. So given one of these task specifications, what we want an agent to do is just generate runs that get the value one. So we think about an agent winning if it's guaranteed to bring about runs uh, that have the value one. So intuitively we can think about the agent as playing a game against its environment and it wins if it guarantees to only bring about runs that have the value 1 according to this predicate task specification psi. Uh, okay, and then finally we can look at two special cases of predicate task specifications that are called achievement and maintenance tasks. So with achievement tasks, the idea is what we give our agent is a set of good states or goal states or target states. And what we're saying to it is, I don't care what you do, just behave in such a way that you guaranteed to produce one of these good or goal states. So that is, on every run that you could possibly generate, I want at least one of these good or goal states to occur. So intuitively you can think of the set of all possible environment states, and then we identify some subset of those, the good states, the goal states, the target states, and what you're saying to your agent when you give it one of these specifications of good states or goal states or target states is just behave in such a way that you end up in this set, that every run that you generate contains at least one good state or goal state. We're not concerned about distinguishing between these uh, good states. They're all equally good as far as we're concerned. We just want at least one of them to result. With a maintenance task, uh, on the other hand, what we do is we say, here are some bad states. I want you to avoid these. You can do whatever you like, but don't ever end up in one of these bad states. So you can think about maintenance tasks as being things like, you know, make sure that the reactor never melts down. So the states where the reactor melts down uh, are the bad states. We simply want our agent to avoid those bad states. So they're called maintenance tasks because we can think of them, the agent is maintaining some state of affairs. It's not maintenance as in fixing something. Okay, so we specify achievement tasks then by defining some set G of good or 
goal states, and these are the target states that we want our agent to aim at. So the agent succeeds if it's guaranteed to bring about one of these good or goal states. With a maintenance task, we specify a set of bad states, and we don't care what the agent does as long as it avoids those bad states. Okay, and then we're not going to go into it, but intuitively you can think about combinations of uh, achievements and maintenance tasks as well, and all sorts of fancier things. But the basic idea is that these are special cases of predicate task specifications. So in summary then, how do we tell an agent what to do? We've looked at, very briefly looked at, a number of different ways of doing that. Number one, utility functions over environment states. For every environment state you say how good it is by assigning it some numeric value. Difficulty with that is how do you take a long-term view? So, number two, utility functions over runs. For every run, for every possible history, you say how good or how bad it is. Difficulty with that approach, where do the numbers come from? So with a predicate task specification, you're not assigning an arbitrary number, it's either a bad run or a good run. And then with achievement tasks, you, you want the agent to end up generating one of these good states. With maintenance tasks, you simply want, to, uh, want it to avoid the bad states. So, how do you tell an agent what to do without telling it how to do it? So far in these videos, we haven't really given a good answer to the question of how does an agent actually make a decision. So that's the issue that we're going to start digging into. And this is, this is the area of agent architectures. When we talk about an agent architecture, what we're talking about is a software design for an agent. It's a, a software architecture which is intended to support decision making uh, with the properties that we've been talking about pre previously, that is to say reactive, proactive, autonomous behaviour. So we've already seen, in fact, a uh, kind of high-level decomposition, a kind of high-level agent architecture, where we decompose an agent into perception, state, decision, and action subsystems. So the perception subsystem responsible for getting information from the environment. The state subsystem responsible for recording that information, deciding what to remember uh, uh, about the environment. The decision-making subsystem, responsible for actually making the decision about what action to perform. And then finally, the action subsystem, performing the action at the interface between the agent and the environment. Um, so what we're going to see now is we're going to dig a little bit deeper, and what we're going to focus on is these systems here. The state, the decision, uh, and to a certain extent, the action subsystems. So, here's a couple of definitions of what an agent architecture is. This one is from Patty Mars, 1991. An agent architecture is a particular methodology for building agents. It specifies how the agent can be decomposed into a set of component modules and how these modules should be made to interact. The total set of modules and their interactions has to provide an answer to the question of how sensor data and current internal state determine the actions and future internal state of the agent. An architecture encompasses techniques and algorithms that support this methodology. So another definition from Leslie Kelbling in the same year, an agent architecture is a specific collection of software or hardware modules, typically designated by boxes with arrows indicating data and control flow among the modules. A more abstract view of an architecture is as a general methodology for designing particular modular decompositions for particular tasks. So, as we will see in the videos that follow, there are a number of different approaches to building agents, a number of different classes of agent architectures. Uh, and we are going to focus on three, or in fact we're going to focus on four, but one of them is a kind of subclass of the first one. So the first one that we're going to look at, which dominated in the early days of AI, right through to, uh, well, right through to the present day, is the idea of symbolic reasoning agents. And as we will see, the idea of symbolic reasoning agents is the idea of building agents that have symbolic and typically logical representations of their environment, and that decide what to do via something like logical reasoning. And as I say, we're going to look at a variant of these symbolic reasoning uh, agents that we will call practical reasoning agents. Um, the problems with these kinds of architectures, which we'll talk about later, led in the mid-1980s to a number of researchers to kind of reject these approaches and look instead at what are called reactive or behavioural architectures. 
where the agent is more like responding to its environment rather than explicitly reasoning about it. But then around about 1990, some researchers said, well, let's try and marry the best of these kind of symbolic and reactive architectures, uh, and uh, they developed what we'll call hybrid agent architectures. But the first one that we're going to look at in the rest of this video, what we're going to talk about is symbolic reasoning architectures. So how do you identify a symbolic reasoning architecture when you see one? Well, you look for two key things. The first thing that you look for is a data structure, an explicit data structure within the agent which contains a symbolic representation of the agent's environment. It's very natural if you're going to build an agent, let's say a robot, to inhabit a particular environment like this office where I'm filming this video, the real world environment of my office, uh, that the way to build that robot is to give it some explicit representation of its environment. That is to give it a model of the environment in, in which it's operating. And the first key idea of these symbolic reasoning agents is that that model is a symbolic one, and in its purest expression, it is a logical one. Now, I realize that sounds a bit abstract, but I'm going to come back and explain that in a little bit more detail. The second key property of a symbolic reasoning architecture, or a deductive architecture, is that decision-making about what action to perform is made via manipulating symbols, which I again sound, I realize sounds a little bit abstract. Uh, in its purest expression, it says that the decision-making is done via logical reasoning. And we'll come back later and explain what that means in a little bit more detail. I do realize it sounds a bit abstract for now. Well, let's just see a picture of uh, uh, what such a symbolic representation might look like. This is a rather hackneyed AI uh, example known as the blocks world. So the blocks world is over here. This is a picture of the environment. We've got a table in this environment and we've got three blocks named A, B and C. Uh, and these blocks can just be configured to be on top of one another or on the table. So here we've got block B is on top of block A, and block A is on the table, and block C is on the table. And that's just the configuration. So over here we've got our agent, and it's got some perceptual subsystem. It's, got some inf it's getting information about that environment. Let's say it's a video camera that's delivering digital video frames as its perceptual data. But then here is our explicit symbolic representation. And here, in fact, this representation uh, is one that uses logic. I mean, it doesn't look like logic, but that's what it is. These are, in fact, predicates of first-order logic. So this first predicate says that block A is on top of uh, block B is on top of block A. So on B A means that block B is on top of block A. On A table means that block A is on the table. Clear B means there's nothing on top of block B. Okay, so on B A. B is on top of A, on A table, A is on the table, clear B, there's nothing on top of block B, on C table, C is on the table, and clear C, there's nothing on top of C. So this is a logical representation which captures pretty much completely this admittedly very simple and somewhat artificial uh, environment. It's completely describing this environment, and it's doing it in uh, a logical way. This is a symbolic, logical representation of this environment. So here there's a data structure within the agent which contains an explicit, symbolic, in fact logical representation of this environment. Well, suppose we want to build this robot, what kinds of problems do we face? Well, the first one is how do you go from this to this? That is, how do you translate this real world environment into this internal symbolic representation of it. And that's what's called the transduction problem. Transduction just means to translate something from one form to another. So here the transduction problem is how do you translate the real world, the environment, into the symbolic representation of it. And then the second problem is the representation and reasoning problem. So if we go back to our example, here the environment is very, very simple. Okay, it's a very, very simple environment, which can be pretty much completely captured by simple facts that look like this. But imagine an agent that's got to inhabit an environment like Times Square in New York or Piccadilly Circus in London. Incredibly dynamic environments with hundreds of people running around, processors continually changing the environment in ways beyond our agent's uh, understanding. 
How do you capture the properties of those kind of environments using these kinds of logical representations? Well, the answer is it's not easy, and it's spawned a huge amount of research uh, uh, into exactly that issue, and that research area is known as knowledge representation. So those are the two key problems, transduction and representation and reasoning. Transduction, how do you translate the world, the environment, into a symbolic representation of it? And the representation and reasoning problem, how do you manipulate and uh, decide what to do with those representations? How do you capture, using those representations, highly dynamic, complex environments? So most researchers would accept that for real-world robotics type applications, neither of those problems is anywhere near solved. And there is one fundamental problem that keeps coming back to haunt us, and that problem is computational complexity. Reasoning with those representations is computationally very, very complex. And because of these problems, as I said earlier, a number of researchers rejected this whole kind of line of attack and looked to alternative kinds of architectures. But nevertheless, it's useful uh, to look at this approach, and that's what we're going to do in uh, the videos that follow. In a uh, symbolic agent architecture, the key ideas are that an agent has an explicitly represented symbolic model of its environment and that decision making about what to do uh, is, is, is done via manipulating that symbolic representation. Now in the purest expression of this whole tradition of symbolic reasoning architectures, the idea is that the internal representation that an agent has of its environment is captured using logic and the decision making about what to do uh, is, is done using logical reasoning. So that's the idea that we're going to explore in uh, this particular video and see how, in principle at least, the idea might work. Just a caveat before we start, I'm not suggesting that what you're about to see is a, an appropriate way to go about building agents. It's a rather naive way to go about building agents. But the point is that it illustrates this principle of representing an environment using logic and making a decision about what action to perform via logical reasoning. So the key idea, what I want you to take away, is that in, in this whole approach, is that when an agent makes a decision about what to do, it proves a theorem to the effect that a particular action is the optimal action to perform. That's how it makes its decision. It proves a theorem, or tries to prove a theorem, to the effect that a particular action is the optimal action to perform. Um, so in what follows, I'm going to use a bit of logical notation, so it helps if you understand the logic notation, but I hope you'll get the main ideas, even if you don't understand the, de the detail. So when we, when in this deductive reasoning approach, when we write a program for an agent, the main thing that we're going to write is a logical theory. A logical theory which encodes the optimal action to perform in any given situation. And we're going to use this uh, Greek letter rho, which looks a bit like a P, uh, to stand for this theory. So this is our logical theory of the optimal action to perform. And as we'll see in later videos, actually this logical theory uh, is usually a set of rules. We usually, we very often actually use, uh, encode that theory as a set of logical rules. Okay, so the program that our agent has is this logical theory row of the optimal action to perform in any given situation. Well, any given situation is captured by our agent's beliefs. And we're going to use this Greek letter big delta, the big delta here with delta standing for database. So delta here is a logical database which has the agent's beliefs, all the information that the agent has about its environment. So delta here is going to be the agent's internal state. So that's the explicitly represented symbolic data structure capturing the information that the agent has about its environment. So we've got a logical theory of the optimal action to perform. That is going to play the part of a program. And then uh, at any given moment, our agent is going to have a delta, which is a set of logical formulae characterizing the state of the environment. Then AC is our set of actions, whatever those actions are, that our agent can perform. And then we're going to use this logical notation uh, to mean that this uh, phi can be proved from this 
database delta using this logical theory or using these rules rho. So this can be proved from this using these rules rho. So this symbol here, which is often called the syntactic turnstile symbol, just means that you can prove this from this using these rules or using this theory rho. Okay, so at the moment it's a little bit abstract. Um, let's see the actual decision-making loop that we're suggesting here. So roughly speaking, what we do is we consider each possible action uh, in turn. So we consider each possible action in the overall set of actions. And we try to prove this predicate do alpha. And the idea is, if we can do that proof, if we can prove do alpha from our current beliefs using our theory of the optimal action, then alpha is the optimal action to perform. So for each possible action, we try to prove that that action is the optimal action to perform. And if it is, then we just say, right, we found the right action to perform, let's just do it. So we return that action. So we consider each action in turn and try and prove that that is the optimal action to perform. So you remember your theory of the optimal action to perform is encoded within that row. So we, when we write our agent program, so to speak, what we do is we encode that theory. Okay, so suppose we get to the end of this loop and we haven't found any optimal action to perform. Okay? So what we then do is we consider each action in turn and we say, well, is it explicitly forbidden? Right? Can we prove not do alpha? So if we can prove not do alpha, okay, then that means we should not perform this action. But if for some particular action we fail to prove that it's forbidden, uh, then this is a reasonable candidate. It's not inconsistent with our theory of uh, optimal action. So that's the candidate for the action to perform. So the first loop just looks at each action and says, can I prove that this is the optimal action to perform? And if we can do this, if we can prove this predicate do alpha, the idea is that then alpha is the optimal action to perform. Uh, if we get to the end of this loop and we still haven't done anything, then we just don't have any good candidates for what to do, so we just return null, so we haven't found a particular action. Let's make this concrete with an example. So this is a 3x3 three three grid world, and the idea is that we've got a robot which is currently in this middle square here, uh, and there is dirt in this grid world. And the grid world has locations, so this is location 0, 2, this is location 1, 2, this is location 2, 2, this is location 0, 0. And the idea is we want the agent to move around and clear up this dirt. So how might we build such an agent? Well, the first thing is, what does the internal model look like? Well, there are a number of choices that we could make, but we're going to use this particular representation. We're going to use predicates in XY to mean that the location of the agent is currently XY. It currently believes it's at location XY. Dirt XY means there is currently dirt at location XY. And facing D, where D is north, south, east, or west, means that the agent is currently facing direction uh, D. The possible actions AC that our agent has are turn, move forward and suck, which is to say switch the vacuum cleaner on. So the idea is that this turn action will turn the agent 90 degrees to the right. Okay? Exactly 90 degrees to the right. And move forward will just move it exactly one grid step forward. So then it's quite easy to come up with a, a bunch of rules and here is one candidate set of rules. I emphasize these are not in any sense elegant, and you can easily do better with a little effort, but they illustrate the point. So we've got rules here. This is our row. This is our theory of the optimal action to perform. So for example, the first rule says, if you believe you're in location 0, 0, and you believe you're facing north, and you don't believe there's dirt at that location, then move forward. If you're in location 0, 1, and you're facing north, and there's no dirt there, then move forward, and so on. So, for example, you can imagine a rule which says, if you're in location 0, 0, and there's dirt there, then do suck. Switch the vacuum cleaner on to clean up the dirt. And it's quite straightforward to expand those rules out into um, uh, a set of rules which will get the agent to move through this environment, clearing up dirt when it sees it. And the internal representation that an agent has is just made up of a bunch of predicates that look like this, which tell it where it is, what direction it's facing, and whether or not it sees any dirt in the current location. And then on the right-hand side of these rules, we have the optimal actions to perform. So I emphasize, this set of rules, firstly, is a rather clunky and not very elegant set of rules, and you can easily do better. 
it's not supposed to be a way of actually implementing a vacuum cleaner agent. It's just supposed to illustrate the idea of deciding what to do via logical reasoning. So, in its purest expression, this deductive reasoning paradigm says that the internal symbolic data structure that an agent has is made up of logical formulas which describe the environment. And here, these logical formulas are things like in 0, 0, facing north, and so on. And the second thing that this approach says is that you decide what to do by proving a theorem. And you try to prove a theorem to the effect that a particular action to perform is the optimal action to perform, given your beliefs. So in our uh, examples, we considered each, in this control loop, we considered each possible action in turn and tried to prove do alpha. And if we could do this proof, then the idea was that alpha was the optimal action to perform, assuming that the world looks like this according to your theory of optimal action. Previously, I've introduced the idea of symbolic reasoning architectures and, more specifically, deductive reasoning architectures. The key idea of these being that an agent has an explicitly represented symbolic model of its environment and that it makes decisions about what action to perform via explicit reasoning with this model, explicit symbolic reasoning. And in its purest expression, the idea that that internal model is a logical representation, it's a bunch of logical formulas, and that the decision about what action to perform is made via explicit logical reasoning, deductive reasoning. Um, what I'm going to do in this video is just introduce uh, a particular uh, programming language which is based on this idea, and the programming language is called Agent Zero. Uh, and Agent Zero uh, is interesting for a number of reasons. It was introduced in 1990 by Yoav Schoen, uh, and it was the first what was, uh, what was called agent-oriented programming language. That is, it was the first programming language which was explicitly developed for programming agents. So that was the first item of novelty. The second item of novelty uh, is that Schoen said it was, a, it was based on a new programming paradigm based on a societal view of computation. That is, that computation would be done by societies of agents working with each other. And then the final, and in some sense the most interesting uh, aspect of it, is that it takes seriously the idea of the intentional stance. So you'll recall the intentional stance, the idea of the intentional stance, is that we characterise the behaviour of agents uh, and explain and predict the behaviour of agents by attributing to the mental states, things like beliefs and desires, and then assume that they will act rationally to try and accomplish their desires given their beliefs. And as we will see, uh, Agent Zero takes this idea very, very seriously and actually has within the language itself things like beliefs and commitments. So, um, what do you have to do to program an agent in Agent Zero? Well, you have to give it four things. The first thing you give it is a set of capabilities. So, capabilities in Agent Zero are basically exactly the actions that we've been talking about. And in fact, when you program an Agent Zero agent, you encode the capabilities as subroutines, essentially, or methods in, in the language. So, an agent has a set of capabilities which are basically actions that it can perform. An agent has a set of initial beliefs, so these initial beliefs just describe to the agent what it thinks the world looks like when it starts executing. So the agent's initial beliefs just describe the initial state of the environment to the agent. Then next it has a set of what are called commitments. And these are things that the agent will do. And in Agent Zero, commitments roughly take the form of a schedule. They say, at this particular time, do this particular action. Okay? And initially, an agent starts off with a bunch of these commitments, which just tell it what it's initially committed to doing. And then finally, the, 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 the program part of an agent uh, is encoded in what are called commitment rules. So we previously saw, when we talked about deductive reasoning architectures, that we would encode a logical theory of the optimal action to perform, and that manifests itself in Agent Zero. That logical theory manifests itself in the form of what are called commitment rules. 
So what these commitment rules do is they tell an agent how to generate new commitments. So that's the key aspect, the, the program part of an agent in Agent Zero is really those commitment rules. So let's look at what those commitment rules uh, 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 look like. Well, like all rules, a commitment rule has a left-hand side and a right-hand side. And on the left-hand side of the commitment rule is a condition, which is made up of two parts. It's made up of a message condition and a mental condition. Now, the idea is the message condition is a condition which matches against the messages that the agent has received. So agents and agent zero can send one another messages, and the message condition matches against those messages that it has received. The mental condition matches against the agent's beliefs, the beliefs that it currently has, that internal representation that it has of its environment. So that's the left-hand side, message condition and mental condition, and then the right-hand side is just an action part. It typically says, okay, in that case, become committed to do this action at this particular time. So uh, a commitment rule consists of those things, and, and the program for an agent is a, basically a bunch of commitment rules. So each decision cycle, each time our agent zero agent goes around its decision cycle, where it has to decide what to do, is it takes each rule in turn and looks to see whether the message condition matches against the messages it's received, whether the mental condition matches against its mental state, its beliefs, and if those two things match, then we say the rule fires, and the right-hand side of that rule becomes a commitment for the agent, typically. Okay. So, um, let's say a little bit more detail about what the actions in Agent Zero might be. Well, basically, there are two types of actions that are allowed in Agent Zero. They can be either what are called private actions, so this is like, uh, an object in an object-oriented programming language executing a, a, a private method, something which is internal to itself. It's exactly that idea, just executing an internal subroutine which you as the Agent Zero programmer have to provide. Or alternatively, as we've already seen, Agent Zero agents can send messages, so we also have communicative messages. And these messages are constrained to be one of three types, either requests, so the idea of an agent requesting another agent to do something, unrequests saying, I no longer want you to do this, or inform messages where you say, I want you to take on board this belief. So the way one agent gets another agent to do something is with a request message. The way that it gets another agent to change its beliefs is through an inform message. So you'll remember, again, from previous videos and from earlier parts of the book, there is no notion of method invocation in the agent world. We're thinking about agents as requesting and informing one another of various things. Okay, here's an example, a slightly stylized example of a commitment rule, but it's only slightly stylized. So here is the commitment rule. Uh, here is the left-hand side of the commitment rule. So these are, this is the condition part, and then this at the bottom is the action part. So what does this rule say? Well, firstly, here is the message condition, and it says that if a particular agent has requested me to do a particular action at a particular time, okay, so if that's a message that I've received, and here agent, time, and action are variables which will match against the actual name of the agent, the time at which it actually asked you to do it in the actual action, Okay? So that's the message condition. If a particular agent has requested me to do a particular action at a particular time, then this is the mental condition. So the B here stands for beliefs. So we've got explicit representations of beliefs within this rule. So it's taking seriously this idea of the intentional stance. So if I believe that currently this agent is my friend and I believe that I have myself the capability to do that action, so that's one of the repertoire of actions that are available to me. And it's not the case that at the time that I'm requested to do that action, I'm already committed to doing any other action. Okay? Then what I do is I take on board this commitment. I commit on behalf of myself to do that action at that particular time. So, to paraphrase, if some particular agent asks me to do something at some time, I believe that that agent is a friend, I believe that I have the capability to do it, and I don't believe that I'm committed to doing something else at the time that it wants me to do that action, then I will take on that particular commitment. So what that means is that this commitment, 
to do this action at this particular time essentially gets added to the schedule of actions that the agent has. And the schedule is just a list of times and corresponding actions. And then the, the actual decision about what to do at any given moment just involves looking at your schedule and seeing what you're supposed to be doing at that particular time. So this is a trivial example, but it at least illustrates, I hope, how these commitment rules work, how you generate these new commitments. And the agent is continually generating and expediting, carrying out those commitments that it's, that it's generated. And you should be able to see uh, in, that it's not too difficult to build up societies of agents that can communicate and cooperate with one another. So agent zero then. The idea in agent zero, a societal model of computation, takes seriously the intentional stance, the idea of programming agents in terms of uh, beliefs and commitments, things like that. To program one of these things, you define a number of commitment rules, which are in agent zero, the analogue of the theory of rational action, which defines what the rational thing for our agent to do is at any given moment. We've seen in previous videos the idea of the symbolic uh, reasoning architectures for agents and the idea of making decisions about what action to perform via logical reasoning. And in this video I'm just going to introduce one well-known uh, programming language which takes this idea very, very seriously. Uh, and this programming language is called Concurrent Metatem. Uh, and the idea uh, in Concurrent Metatem is that you program an agent by giving it a temporal logic specification of its desired behaviour. So you'll remember previously when we talked about deductive reasoning architectures, we had this idea of row being uh, a set of rules, a logical theory which encodes the optimal action for our agent to perform at any given moment. Well, in concurrent metatem, uh, that row, that set of rules which define the optimal action to perform, uh, is encoded in temporal logic. Well, temporal logic sounds a bit scary, so let's just see uh, how the temporal logic used in concurrent metatem works. It's actually quite intuitive. The idea is that we use a bunch of what are called temporal operators to augment classical logic. So here's the first of these operators, this empty box symbol. The idea is we apply this empty box symbol to a logical formula, and it means it is now and it always will be true that this formula is true. Okay? It is now and always will be true that this is true. Okay? Now and forevermore, this will be true. So this diamond symbol here means eventually, it means at some point in the future, it will be true that. So we read this formula as, as it is now and always will be the case that agents are important, and we read this formula here as uh, it will at some point in the future be the case that concurrent metatem is important. So these are what's called unary operators, they take a single argument. Here we have a binary operator, this U here, and the U stands for until. And what this means here is that the right hand side is eventually true, and that all the time points until then, hence U, until, at all the time points until then, the left hand side is true. So in this case, we are not friends, not friends us, until apologise you. So at some point in the future you apologise, and at all the time points until we get there, we are not friends. So the model of time that underpins concurrent metatem is what's called a discrete model, and it has the idea of what's called next states, and this circle refers to these next states. This means in the next state that I'm in, apologise you. So think about it as meaning tomorrow. In fact, what it means in concurrent metatem is the next decision cycle that I'm in, you apologise. So these operators, the empty box, the diamond, the U, and the empty circle, these are temporal operators, which we apply to formulas of classical logic to get what are called temporal formulas. Okay, so the idea then in concurrent metatem is we write down a bunch of these formulas in the form past implies future. And the way that we interpret those rules is, if the past matches 
this formula, the past part of this formula, if the things that I've seen match the past time part of this formula, then I will become committed to the future time part. I will try to make the future look like this. So if the past looks like this, then I make the future look like this. So this gives rise to the name of the paradigm. It's sometimes called declarative past and imperative future. So we're continually looking at these rules and saying, does what I've witnessed match this pastime part? And if it does, then we say the rule fires and it becomes a commitment to try and make the future look like this. So here is a simple example of a MetaTem program, and this is actually a resource controller. So the, the idea is there's a resource, like a printer, which is infinitely renewable. You can use it again and again and again, but it's non-shareable. So you should only ever allocate it to one uh, individual at any given time. And here is a program which encodes these kind of ideas. So it's got two rules in this MetaTem program. The first rule says, if yesterday, the last decision cycle I was in, so that's what that partially filled in square says, if the last decision cycle I was in, individual X asked for the resource, then eventually I will give it. The second rule says that if I give to X and I give to Y, then X and Y must in fact be the same individual. So this first rule says that whenever somebody asks you, then you commit to eventually give them. You promise essentially that you're eventually going to give them. The second rule says that you never give to more than one individual at the same time. So there is a very high level, succinct definition of the behavior of a resource controller. So this, we say this is a concurrent MetaTem program. A bunch of rules of the form past implies future. So if I think yesterday somebody asked me for the resource, then I commit to eventually giving them the resource. Well, to turn those programs into agents uh, in concurrent MetaTem, we have to give them a name and an interface. So the name just uniquely identifies them in the system, and the interface defines the messages that the agent will send and receive. So as in agent zero, our agents can send messages in concurrent MetaTem, but these messages in concurrent MetaTem are just simple predicates. So we don't think in concurrent MetaTem of having informal requests, they are just simple predicates. So let's have a look at our resource controller, which we're going to dress up as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So Snow White, the, the story goes, Snow White has a bag of sweets, and she's prepared to give out these sweets, but she will only give to one dwarf at any given time. So Snow White has, here is the Snow White program, and it is in fact the resource controller that we just looked at. You can see that the rules there are exactly the same as the rules that we defined earlier. So there's her name, Snow White, that just uniquely identifies her in the system. And then we've got between round brackets, we've got messages that Snow White will listen to. So whenever she receives a message, what she does, whenever she receives a message from another agent, she tries to match that message against the ones that she will uh, receive. Okay? And in this case, she's just looking for messages that say, ask for the resource. And then between square brackets are messages that she will send. And the idea is whenever a predicate, whenever something becomes true inside her beliefs, she looks to see whether this is one of the messages that she will send, that is, if the predicate is of the form give something, and if, if it does match, if it is one of the messages that she will send, then she broadcasts that message out to all the other agents in the system. So, there's her name, the messages that she's listening for, the messages that she will send, and the program part. So we can put Snow White together with some other agents, so I'll just give a couple of examples. So here, we have an agent called Eager, right? There's his name, so this line defines his interface. His name, messages he's listening for, messages he will send. So messages he's listening for, he's only listening for give messages. Intuitively, the Eager agent is just listening out to see when he is given one of Snow White's suites. And he's, he will send ask messages. So he's listening to give messages, and he will send ask messages. And then he's got two rules. The first one says, this just means that when you start executing, when the, uh, when the eager agent starts executing, this rule immediately fires. So the idea is, he will immediately make this true, ask eager. Now ask is one of the messages that he will send, so when this gets added to his beliefs, we get a match there. This is one of the messages that he'll send, so this predicate, ask eager, will get broadcast out to all the other agents in the system. 
Okay, so this predicate ask eager will get broadcast out to all the other agents in the system. The second rule says, if ever eager is given a sweep, then he will immediately ask again. So you can see when you put this behavior together with Snow White, what happens is eager starts out by making this true, ask eager. So that becomes true in his beliefs. But it's one of, ask is one of the messages he sends, so he then immediately broadcasts this ask eager out to all the other agents in the system. But then Snow White is listening out for ask messages, so she sees that ask message, then this rule fires and she commits to eventually give eager one of these suites. So give X where X matches to eager. So this becomes, when she makes that commitment true, this is one of the messages that she will send. So she broadcasts give eager back out into the system. Eager is listening for give messages. So it's one of the messages that he will receive. So he, when Snow White gives him a suite, he adds that to his beliefs. And the next decision cycle that he's on, this rule fires and he immediately asks it for a sweep again. That message then gets broadcast out again, goes back to Snow White. Uh, this rule fires again, she gives him a sweep and so on. In previous videos, we've seen the idea of agents that make decisions about what action to perform uh, by using logical reasoning. And uh, the basic idea is that they prove a theorem to the effect that a particular action is the optimal action to perform, uh, given their beliefs. Well, there are many problems with this approach, uh, but one of the kind of conceptual problems that people have uh, is that it doesn't seem to resemble the way that we make decisions. And by and large, we seem to be pretty good decision makers. We do it every day of our lives. So uh, in this uh, video, what we're going to introduce is the idea of agents that make decisions in a way that intuitively, at least, seems to be a bit closer to the way that we make decisions uh, about what action to perform. And what we're going to talk about are practical reasoning agents. Now I emphasise these practical reasoning agents do have quite a lot in common with the kind of agent architectures that we've seen before, in particular the symbolic architectures. And the key commonality is that we still assume that they have some explicitly represented symbolic model of the environment, which we call their beliefs. But the actual process by which they make their decisions is not via explicit logical reasoning. Okay, so, well, what is practical reasoning? Uh, here is a quote from Michael Brackman. Practical reasoning is a matter of weighing conflicting considerations for and against competing options, where the relevant considerations are provided by what the agent desires, values, cares about, and what the agent believes. And practical reasoning is distinguished from theoretical reasoning. So roughly speaking, practical reasoning is reasoning that's directed towards action, whereas theoretical reasoning is reasoning that's directed towards beliefs. So the classic example of theoretical reasoning is reasoning of the kind, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. The effect of that reasoning, which is a classic example of logical reasoning, is to change your beliefs. It changes your beliefs uh, uh, about Socrates. That is, you take on board the belief that Socrates uh, is, is mortal. So practical reasoning is reasoning that's directed towards action. And there seem to be two components in the kind of practical reasoning that we engage in. And that we call those components deliberation and means ends reasoning. So the intuitively, the way to think about this is as follows. Every morning you wake up and you're lying in bed and you're thinking, what am I going to do with my day? What is it that I'm going to accomplish with my day? And you fix upon certain things that you want to accomplish. And that process is deliberation deciding what, it's, what it is that you want to achieve. What are the things that you're going to try to work towards? That's deliberation. But then once you've fixed upon those things, you've decided that these are the things you're going to try and achieve, you're faced with a problem. And the problem is, how do you actually achieve those? Uh, and so this process of figuring out how we're actually going to achieve them is called means ends reasoning. So the means are the actions available at your disposal, the things that you can do, and the ends are the things that you want to accomplish. So means ends reasoning means trying to figure out how you're going to perform actions so as to bring about uh, the ends. 
So the outputs of the deliberation process, after you've deliberated, the result of that is that you have what we'll call intentions, things that you want to accomplish. Um, intentions are very often called goals, and I'll very often uh, use that uh, terminology as well. The outputs of the means-ends reasoning process are plans, essentially sequences of actions. And the idea is that you perform that sequence of actions and it ends up accomplishing your intention or your goal. So the outputs of the deliberation process are intentions. So let's ask ourselves what kinds of properties intentions might have. So this classification of the properties of intentions comes from Cohen and Lamech in 1990. So the first and most fundamental pro uh, property that intentions have is that they pose problems for agents. They pose problems for agents in that they force an agent to start to think about how am I going to achieve them. If you tell your flatmate that you're going to get up and go to university today uh, at, at the start of the day, but he comes home in the evening and you're still lying in bed, you would, he would be inclined to say that you never actually had an intention to go to university in the first place. So when you say you've got an intention to do something, you've got to devote resources to it. You've got to work towards it. Okay? It poses a problem for you. You've got to start to try to figure out how it is that you're going to achieve it and actively work towards it. The second property that they have is that they provide a filter for adopting further intentions. So if you decide, if you choose to decide uh, that you're going to go to university today, then that precludes all the other alternatives. You can't go to the beach, you can't go to the pub, you can't climb a mountain. All those other possible intentions are ruled out. You've got this intention to be to the university, so you've got to plan around that intention. That's there, you can only take on board other intentions which are consistent with that. Agents track the success of their intentions and they're inclined to try again if their attempts fail. Well, this just means, you know, if you're trying to get to university and you plan to do this by catching a bus and the bus doesn't turn up, well, what are you going to do? You're going to try and get a taxi, you're going to run, you're going to cycle, you're going to develop some alternative means of getting to the university. You're not just going to give up. Intentions are sticky and they push you to try to accomplish them. Intentions are also related to other mental states, and in particular, they're related to beliefs. So how are they related to beliefs? Well, for example, uh, agents believe their intentions are possible. Okay, uh, if you have an intention to go to the university, then you must believe there is at least some chance that you're going to succeed with it. Uh, and these next two properties, roughly speaking, say that uh, with the following wind, if all goes well, then you believe you will succeed with your intentions. You don't believe that you're going to fail. So you can plan around the assumption that your intentions are going to succeed. So intentions are related to other mental states like beliefs. Agents believe their intentions are possible, and roughly speaking, they think if all goes well, they will succeed with their intentions. The last property that we're going to talk about uh, is what's called the side effect problem. And the issue is as follows. Suppose you have an intention to go to the dentist, okay? And you know that necessarily, as a consequence of going to the dentist, you're going to suffer pain. The question is, do you intend to suffer pain as well? That is, do you intend all the consequences of your intentions? Uh, and this is called the package deal problem, the side effect problem. And roughly speaking, the general consensus is no, you don't intend all the side effects, all the consequences of your intentions. Okay, intentions are stronger than desires. Here's another quote from Michael Brackman. My desire to play basketball this afternoon is merely a potential influencer of my conduct this afternoon. It must vie with other relevant desires before it's settled what I will do. In contrast, once I intend to play basketball this afternoon, the matter is settled. I normally need not continue to weigh the, weigh the pros and cons when the afternoon arrives. I just normally proceed to execute my intentions. So desires are different from intentions because desires are potential influences of, of action, whereas intentions are direct influences of action. One other important difference is that we don't require that desires are logically consistent. It's perfectly possible to entertain a whole bunch of desires which are completely incompatible with one another. But the intentions that we choose for a rational agent, we require that those intentions are logically consistent. Let's just say something about means-ends reasoning. So means-ends reasoning, the process of figuring out how are you going to accomplish your intentions. And the output of means-ends reasoning is a plan. 
And a plan is just a program, that's all it is. It's a sequence of actions. Do this, then do this, then do this. So the intention is to be at the university for a lecture. The plan involves walking to the bus stop, catching a bus, getting off the bus at the other end, and so on. It's a sequence of actions which is executed by an agent. And a means ends reasoner, a planning system, takes as input three things. It takes a goal, the intention that's going to be achieved, the thing that you want to accomplish, the state of the environment, your beliefs about what the world looks like now, and then the means at your disposal, the possible actions that you have that you can use within your plan. And then the planner has to figure out an appropriate sequence of actions, an appropriate plan, an appropriate program using these actions which, when executed from this state, will accomplish this intention. So practical reasoning consists of two processes. Deliberation, the results of which are intentions. Means-ends reasoning, the results of which are plans.